So this is our second webinar, and we are going to be talking to Ian Campbell, who is one of the two first um, yield residents that will start this summer. Um, we'll uh, go through introductions. I'm Mike Rippey. Uh, I'm the digital archivist and multimedia producer at the Snipe Museum of Art. I run Yield Magazine. Um, I met Ian at SPE Midwest last fall, and through his work, we've stayed connected, and it's one of the reasons why we decided to pick him as a resident for this summer. So, Ian, go ahead and introduce yourself, and then um, we'll jump into some questions. Sure. Uh, well, thanks, Mike, for the opportunity to talk about my work. I'm also really excited about the upcoming residency. I've been to the UP of Michigan uh, once before when I was in high school, I went on a backpacking trip and I remember it being very beautiful and very mosquito ridden. So I think there's a lot of possibilities for making interesting work there. Um, yeah, my name's Ian Campbell. I am assistant professor of art at Lyon College. I teach photography and the digital art classes here. Um, the, uh, yeah, I met uh, Mike at the SBE conference back in October, and I was talking about my project called Ghost Flowers, which is mostly what I'll be talking about today. I would say that I'm mostly a photographer, although my work also includes other elements, film, video, drawing, sculpture, just kind of whatever the project needs to exist. Um, is there any, did I cover everything? Is there anything else? Yeah, yeah. So let's just jump into some questions. So how, you know, how did you know you were going to become a photographer and an instructor? And um, I guess, like, if you could explain kind of the path that got you to where you are now. Mm -hmm. well, I've been interested in art and making images since I was a pretty little kid. Um, I spent a lot of my youth drawing mostly. I didn't really get into photography until high school and then my grandparents gave me a camera, my first real SLR film camera as a high school graduation gift. Um, then when I went to college, I was not actually planning to study photography or art. I thought I was gonna be a biology major. <laughs> uh, and then very quickly realized that involved a whole lot of math. <laughs> And I was much more interested in exploring ideas about nature through visual images. Uh, eventually, I ended up taking photography classes with Greg Schreck, who teaches at Wheaton College, that's where I did my undergrad. Um, fell in love with analog photography in particular, black and white, darkroom based stuff, um, which is what I continue to use primarily to this day. Um, after college, I kind of bounced around between a lot of random jobs before I decided that teaching might be a good fit for me. Um, eventually went to Ohio University, which is where I got my MFA. And uh, shortly after that, was able to uh, start teaching here at Lyon, which has been a really good experience. It's a pretty small program. I've got about 20 art majors. I'm one of two full-time faculty, so it's a very kind of intimate and a flexible work environment to work in. <laughs> so, um, so let's just, I guess, dive right into your, your work. Um, it's, you know, it, you, you talked about how you still want to explore kind of the physical world, but you do it through photography. Um, like, can you start talking about how that kind of that developed also? Like, you maybe some like initial projects and how you got got to the Ghost Flowers project and how, you know, maybe, you know, how that's progressed since then? Yeah, I mean, my work has always been in some ways in, informed by or in dialogue with other disciplines, particularly science, literature, um, and influenced by mythology and things as well. Um, when I was in grad school, I started making um, work that explored how humans perceive the natural world and kind of project desires onto it. 
Um, I did a series of it's kind of like fantastic constructed sea creatures that played on people's sense of imagination about what might be at the bottom of the ocean. Um, actually, I've got one here. Let's see if I can move my camera. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so you can kind of get a sense of, of what that project was about. Uh, my MFA thesis project was, actually here, let me see if I can do this screen share thing. Okay. So what I did for my MFA thesis, okay. I went to Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is where in 1817, a whole bunch of people saw some sort of strange creature they couldn't identify, which they described as a sea serpent. <laughs> so I went to a bunch of different locations where people reported seeing sea serpents and took photographs there. Um, so that was, I guess, also instrumental because I, that was when I started thinking about the limitations of photography and how do you photograph or how do you represent something that can't be photographed. So this creature uh, arrived in 1817, uh, well before photography was invented and no one was able to capture it or document it fully. So it's kind of this unsolved mystery of, nat or of uh, natural history. <laughs> uh, and that kind of played into the, uh, the ghost flowers project let me see if I can get back to the screen with you guys. Yeah, I can, I can see that. I can see where this, you know, this, uh, this idea of like not being able to be seen. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that that's kind of cutting through all of your work, even the current work that with the, the, the cave photography. So it's, mm -hmm. that's interesting that it kind of runs through everything that you've been doing. Yeah, so the newest project I've been working on since making Ghost Flowers has been uh, photographs in caves that are trying to reference uh, astrophotography and <laughs> things so far out in the universe, we can't actually photograph them. Uh, so that kind of plays in with ghost flowers because that project um, was a catalog of invasive plant species. So they're plants that are originally from Europe or Asia or Africa and other continents that have somehow made it into North America and have spread throughout the world. Um, so they're so massively distributed, it's almost impossible to link them to any one particular place. They're pretty much everywhere. So I can see some kind of connections there. I think there's also a connection. Um, I'm always interested in uh, linking 21st century environmental concerns and photographic concerns with 19th century things. I think there's a lot of overlap between the Victorian era and the contemporary era. Um, as far as like investigating materials and kind of romantic sensibility, um, whether that's longing for a connection to nature or longing for the past, I think that's also pretty relevant in uh, our current age. Does that kind of answer the question? <laughs> yeah, and this, and plus the you know the idea of how you know scientific discovery has kind of progressed, and it's you know the the, the new things that we discover that in, lead to other things, and I you know I, I can definitely see that in your work also. So, did you want to talk about and show some images from Ghost Flowers? I mean, it's. Uh, mm -hmm. the, it's it's they're, they're really interesting when you when I. How I met Ewan was through, uh, like we said before, SP Midwest, and it was during a portfolio review. And he had his portfolio and unzipped it and then pulled out these really brightly colored uh, photograms. He'll go into more detail about what they are and how they were made. But they were just amazing. I mean, they just, you know, really colorful, had a big impact, very kind of abstract until you started looking at them more closely. But if you want to go ahead and start talking about those and, you know, talk about the different images and how you created them. Yeah, uh, are you still able to see what's on my screen or do I need to jump back into the... Yeah, if you go down to the bottom and hit share screen. All right, let's try it again. <laughs> okay. 
Yep, that's your desktop. So anything on your desktop we can see right now. Cool. cool. Yeah, so uh, Ghost Flowers was a series of uh, lumen prints, which some of you photographers might be familiar with, might have experimented with. It's basically a lensless photographic technique where you take a piece of traditional black and white darkroom photo paper, uh, then put some sort of objects on it, take it out into the daylight, expose it to light for anywhere from a few minutes to a few days. <laughs> and depending on weather conditions and lighting conditions and what you're putting on top of the paper and what type of paper you're using, you can get all kinds of variable results. So right here you can see I've got, this is just a door with a piece of photo paper, this blue thing here. Uh, I've got a piece of heavy duty glass to hold the plants in place, put a bunch of flowers on it. And as the sun works its magic, it eventually turns into something like this. Uh, this was a fairly short exposure, but if you leave it out longer, it'll turn into something like this. So there's a pretty wide range of different colors and textures you can get. Um, I was introduced to the process back in 2015. My friend Josh Raftery was teaching an alternative processes class at Ohio University. And he needed, he needed someone to cover for a few days when he was going to be out of town. So he says, hey, do you want to do a lumen uh, workshop? I was like, sure, what's lumen printing? Uh, and then after he uh, explained it to him, I was really taken with uh, both how straightforward and easy it is to do, but also how rich and variable the results can be. Um, so it's partly just me uh, experimenting with a new technique, but there were a couple other reasons that I picked it up. One of them was, uh, this is my daughter Phoebe. She was born in 2015 in September. So I was looking for a project that I could do while simultaneously taking care of a newborn. Uh, previously, I've been doing wet plate collodion, which is very labor intensive and has all sorts of toxic chemicals. Uh, whereas lumen printing, you only need one hand pretty much to put some plants on a piece of paper and expose it to sunlight. So I could do that at the same time as uh, keeping an ear out for when she would wake up from naps. So that was part of it as well. Um, this is another image from that series. I, s I decided to use plants that were invasive species, um, partly because of this new neighborhood we were living in. This is a photograph of the Wonder Hills neighborhood in Athens, Ohio, um, which is like really beautiful neighborhood surrounded by plants and trees. And people would always say, oh, it's so great. You live in a neighborhood surrounded by nature. Uh, but then as I was kind of walking around the neighborhood, I started to notice these very unnatural things, like the fact that most of these plants, most of this green mass are uh, organisms that have somehow made it over here from Eurasia and other parts of the world. So I decided to make a catalog of uh, botanical specimens that had uh, come over from other parts of the world. So a lot of these, like this one, some of these were imported uh, deliberately by European settlers, like multiflora rose, it's a really beautiful uh, white rose bush uh, that somehow just uh, kind of grew out of control. <laughs> Other ones have, or have come over accidentally, but I was interested in um, kind of using the conventions from the 1800s. There were these people like uh, Anna Atkins or Henry Fox Talbot, other photographers from the mid 1800s who were making catalogs of botanical specimens as part of, I guess, like a scientific survey. Um, I think my approach is a little bit different. Uh, if you look at an Anna Atkins print, you know, the plants are very well centered in the middle of the page. There's right. plenty of breathing room around them. And mine, I was trying to, let's see if I can find a good example. Do something more like this, where the plants 
push out towards the edge and kind of um, threaten to take over. All of these are on 20 by 24 inch pieces of paper um, because I chose that format because it has a kind of human scale to it. It references portraiture with this kind of vertical orientation. And the size of it is, you know, not super large, but it's large enough that um, it can be kind of um, overwhelming or all encompassing if you're standing in front of it in the gallery. So this particular project was uh, meant to be on the wall or experienced in person. Right, when you were showing them to me, they they were, you know, they did make a big impact and they, you know, I think because of the size, you could see, you know, because it's a one-to-one -one ratio with the plant life, mm -hmm. you could really see a lot of the detail and depending on, you know, which, you know, images I was looking at, you could start, you could see uh, kind of a flat surface where you could see a lot of depth to them, a lot of layers. And uh, plus the, with the, the way the color and the developing, you know, going through the you know, different exposure times, um, you know, they, they kind of give this idea of like, this daguerreotype feel where the edges get soft and there's kind of an odd kind of coloring to it. Um, right. That's what really, I really enjoyed about them. Yeah, I can flip through a few others just to kind of give a sense of the different colors that are possible. <laughs> and yeah, I think one of the kind of interesting challenges of doing this yield residency is that um, if it ends up being a book or something or published in a magazine, that's kind of a, it's like a different end result. I think I'll have to compose differently and uh, keep scale in mind differently if I'm making images for something that's gonna be like spread out between two pages rather than right. posted on a wall. Yeah, because it'd be nice to maintain some idea of this life-size quality with them, too. So, yeah, we'll have to consider that when we do the printing of the book. I'm also interested to, I guess, find out what kind of, once I get there, to figure out what kinds of uh, scientific research are being done there and what kinds of biological organisms are present. You know, in my neighborhood in Athens, Ohio, uh, most of the plant is pretty disturbed kind of ecosystem, even though it looks green. Most of the plants are invasive species or things that are not native. You know, going to a pristine environment in the North Woods, I think it'll be a little bit different. Um, uh, yeah, it'll be like a fun challenge to figure out how to come up with some sort of conceptual framework. Right. How is it yeah. Yeah, and the, the location is a is an actual research, environmental research facility, and so they will have all of this documented already. I'm sure they've had to deal with you know deal with invasive invasive species there. Sorry, everybody, I'm a little sick, so I'll uh, try to get my enunciate a little better. But um, yeah, they they've had to deal with a lot of uh, you know different environments and changes in environments, wildlife, things like that. So I'm sure they have a lot a lot of uh, specimens already available there. And, uh, you know, depending on where you go with this, I'm sure the, the students, it'll be a, you know, a bunch of uh, undergraduate students that'll be involved in the research projects. And they'll have, a, you know, they could probably give you some input as well on, you know, what they're interested in, what the, why they came there to do the research. Um, so, yeah, it should, be, it should be really interesting. I know there's a lot of, you know, interest uh, with climate change and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see kind of what, the research kind of bears out. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm really interested in that dialogue between art and science, not necessarily collaboration, but right. I don't know. I find that I get a lot just talking to people involved in science. And I think there's a commonality between art and science where you're both looking at things that are very specific to try to make conclusions about things that are somewhat universal or more broad reaching. So that's something I'm also interested in exploring this summer. 
Yeah, so I mean, if you want to, you can talk a little bit about the, the project that you had been currently working on also, which also involves research and science and all these connections that are made throughout your work, um, the, the cave photographs. Sure. Yeah, let me pull up my website. I don't have a whole lot of images put up online yet. Um, so this is more work in progress. Um, so one of my colleagues here at Lyon College, uh, Dave Thomas, teaches biology, and he is an astrobiologist, which means that he, which when I first heard that, I was like, well, how do you study life in, among the stars? <laughs> we haven't discovered that yet. <laughs> so what he does is he uh, studies how organisms adapt to extreme environments, places like caves where there's no light and very few nutrients and figuring out how life exists there and trying to extrapolate uh, if we find organisms on a comet or uh, another planet somewhere, what that might look like. Um, so I've been going on some of these caving expeditions with, uh, with Dave and some other people in the, uh, the local chapter of the Speleological Association. Um, and I've been trying to make images that look like outer space. <laughs> uh, but kind of, so when I first started this, I was thinking, how am I going to make images that look like NASA photographs? I can't afford a Hubble Space Telescope or some of the high tech equipment that uh, NASA has access to. Um, so then I started kind of looking a little bit further back into history and uh, some of the very early images of space. And particularly, there's a photo book by Naismith and Carpenter called The Moon, where they basically constructed their own scale replica of the moon out of plaster and wood because photography was not yet technologically advanced enough to actually get close-up photos of the moon. Um, so I've been, I mean, this one in particular, I thought looked a lot like images from that book. We're not really sure what it is you're looking at. And a lot of them have this kind of a, a perspective, like you're hovering above the surface of an alien planet from a drone or something. I mean, this one you kind of can imagine this being an alien city. They're actually just a bunch of uh, stalagmites. Um, so I'm also interested in uh, photographs that don't function as a straightforward document of something, but that can stand in for something else or allow viewers to imaginatively uh, project whatever they want to on something. Like this one is, this one could be stars or different galaxies, or it could be water droplets on the surface of a cave. You don't necessarily know. This photo I took because uh, Dave told me that this particular surface, all this pitting is caused by organisms that live in the dark and eat rock. <laughs> so if you're gonna find life on Mars or somewhere, uh, it's probably a good sign of what it might look like. This photo was uh, from Onondaga Cave in central Missouri, um, which is a pretty large cave, but uh, as we were kind of going through it, this is a show cave, so it's already pre-lit. And as the tour guide takes you through, they turn the lights off behind you as you go through to conserve electricity. <laughs> so you're always conscious of uh, this vast black space and how much room is back there, even though you can't actually see it which I thought is like kind of a good metaphor for why humans continue to want to explore and discover new things. Um, the sense that there's still something out there somewhere. Anyway, that's all I've got on the web so far. Again, this is a pretty new work that I'm still working on. Uh, these prints are made using the zeotype process, which is a palladium based process similar to platinum, but it's a little, little bit cheaper and a little bit easier to manage. Um, I 
chose that process partly for pragmatic reasons, because when you're shooting in a cave using a very small point and shoot camera, I've got a little Olympus TG5, which is waterproof and shock resistant and um, one of the few cameras I would feel safe taking down into a uh, dark, wet, dirty cave. So shooting with this small camera in low light, you get a lot of noise. So to kind of mitigate that, I wanted to use a hand-coated emulsion that kind of softens it a little bit. Uh, but I also liked it because it looks a lot like those 18th or 19th century photographs by Naismith and Carpenter, um, where they're kind of just imagining what an alien planet might look like. So there's a little bit of disorientation in time going on, as well as disorientation in terms of space and uh, scale. Right, yeah. And I, this is what makes, I think, doing the residency at Undirk East gonna be, is going to be really interesting. I don't know what is up there. They may have some kind of, you know, cave formations. Who knows? I don't know. I haven't looked at everything that they've, they're kind of been doing research on up there. Um, but the idea that you're going to be in an area, it's 7,500 acres, and this idea of exploring and trying to find something that's there that, you know, looking at it through an artistic eye, I think is, is you know, I know that the directors there are very excited about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think it's going to be great. Um, so I think if anybody has any questions, and let me look and see on Facebook if anybody's sent any messages out. Uh, I'm not seeing a whole lot here. So I just, you know, the residency is going to be for you and both for John is going to be a two week long residency. Um, it's a pilot project. Once we get through the residency, we'll evaluate it and see about either. I imagine we'll, you know, definitely keep the, the one summer at East and West happening. But then if, uh, depending on the director, the director and, and some of the board members for UNDERC are actually interested in expanding this idea of an artist residency. And they've talked about other um, art forms, writing, you know, other visual art um, and things like that, too. So um, I, I know they're really excited about it. Um, you know, UNDERC provides the residential area and then we're going to provide a stipend for the work for the time that you're there and uh you know i'm just really excited about the whole idea once you're there you know i hope to plan i plan on getting up to both east and west i'm definitely be i'll be getting the east so you know hopefully we can do some kind of interview again or or do some you know uh you know i'll, I'll see what you're doing and probably document some of the things that you're into and uh and then going out west would be a you know more of an effort um but yeah that's kind of the plan and um yeah i mean it's exciting um i'm glad that we're connected with you now as a organization and i think we'll you know continue to keep track of what you how you, what you're doing with your work and uh john's and anybody else that starts getting more involved with yield especially in a direct capacity as a, as a resident. Um, not getting any questions. So if you don't have any, if there's anything else you want to share in, just feel free. Uh, if not, I think we'll wrap things up. Yeah, I think I've covered all of the basics. Um, uh, feel free to pass on my contact info to anyone who comes up with more questions later. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a pretty cool program, and I think once it gets going, I think a lot of people will be interested in participating, uh, not just photographers, but people from other art fields as well, like you say. Yeah, yeah. And as far as, like, keeping this conversation going, we're going to, you know, this will remain on the, the Facebook page. It'll be, get, it'll be put on the, uh, the website, and we actually have a uh, small... Um, Facebook group where we're hoping to build some more community conversation and find out more of what people want to see um, with these live video 
kind of interviews and uh, panel discussions. Um, so if people want to get on the Facebook group, um, and then, you know, Ian can get on there too. And if, you know, someone has more questions or on the, on the actual Facebook page, that's up for anyone to have conversation on. So, you know, ask, ask us questions, ask us questions about Ian's work, ask us questions about, uh, the yield project, uh, about things that you would want to see. Um, we definitely want to get feedback on everything that we're doing because we want to make sure that we're, you know, getting people what they want um, and really connect to the project. There's a lot of other things coming up that we are, you know, excited about using this live kind of meeting space um, and other projects and, you know, other things related to yield. Sorry, again, I, I feel like um, the, the being a, having a cold has really affected me tonight. But I wanted to get this in because I don't want to, you know, I want to make sure everybody's uh, understands that we're determined to, you know, keep keep this going and really want to see a lot of uh, interaction. So thank you, Ian, for being a part of this meeting, um, this interview, and uh, we'll definitely stay in touch. And maybe we can do, you know, another one before the residency begins. Um, maybe talk about, you know, some of the research, you know, interactions with the directors there that you might have before the actual project starts. I think that's interesting and I, I would really like to find out more about what your plans are. So thank you. And if you don't have any other questions or comments, we'll go ahead and end the meeting and. All right, well, yeah, thanks Mike. It's been uh, fun talking with you and whoever else is out there in the <laughs> ether about my right. life. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know what? In the future, we may actually try to get more um, people on the panel so there can be more Q&A. Um, one thing that we're going to do with this, we're going to start a uh, monthly photo book club, and that's one of the things we're going to do. We're going to have the photographer on with a host and then a couple other people so then we can really kind of get in there and discuss more of uh, the work and the uh, collection. So, um this is always an experiment. It's always two steps forward, one step back. So we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this interview, you know, on the, the group page and then see how that goes and, and then see, you know, how we can improve um, every episode or, you know, meeting, however you want to describe this. So that's it. We'll wrap it up. Uh, thanks again, Ian. And I'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks. Bye.